Entrepreneurs Over 40, episode 32, featuring Connie Inukai talking about being an inventor. When we were children, we were curious about things around us. When does this change? Why does it have to change? I'm proud to be a trailblazer among women inventors and never lose my sense of curiosity. You're listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40, the show for somewhat mature entrepreneurs and side hustlers. And now your host, Greg Mills. Our guest today retired from teaching technical writing at the University of Maryland and John Hopkins University for almost four decades. Today, she's thriving in her second act as an inventor, a grandmapreneur, an author, speaker, and a caregiver to two young grandchildren. She is living proof that the second act entrepreneur can succeed if only they focus on what matters most to them. She has found that entrepreneurship is a mindset at any age. Without further ado, Connie Inukai. Thank you so much, Greg. It's so nice to be on your show. It's great to to have you here. So can you take a few moments and fill in the gaps from that intro and bring us up to speed with what's going on in your world today? Sure. So I actually retired from being a teacher for 40 plus years. And who would have known? I would have never thought that this would be my life now. So I retired at age 68. I started becoming an inventor. And I knew nothing about inventing. Zero. So I had to learn. And I think that one of the great things about uh, growing older is that if you keep learning, you stay younger. Actually, next week, I'm going to be 74 years old. Oh, wow. Yep. I would not believe it. Thank you. I certainly qualify for your show of over 40. So two things keep me young. One is I'm always learning. And the second one is I have my two young grandchildren who I watch, and I think they keep me very young. You mentioned that you retired from teaching technical writing for almost four decades. Did you have any idea at all where life was going to take you? What did you have planned? I had no idea. All I knew is I wanted to retire because anyone who went to college knows that you pull all-nighters to get your reports done and to study for exams. Well, they do it for four years. I did it for 40. (laughs) I used to pull all-nighters to grade reports because I taught engineers and computer scientists how to write reports. So I used to stay up all night doing it, and I I was so glad to retire, but now I stay up all night doing businesses, (laughs) but it's much more fun for me. Okay, I guess I didn't think that through, but yeah, you really couldn't skimp on on the technical writing grading aspect. Yeah, you have to give them a grade, and you have to make comments Mm -hmm. on why they got their grade. It got a little bit hard for me because students in college nowadays are expecting everything. They expect that if they go to class and if they do their work, why don't they get an A? And I was a pretty easy grader, but I reserve the A's for those people who deserve it. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people felt that they needed an A just because they did the work. I definitely did not expect an A when I was in college. Students are different now. It it was very hard because I want to give everyone an A, but then I would be fired. Mm-hmm. If I give everybody an A, I would be fired, <laughs> you know, because those are good schools I taught at. And they have a lot of credibility, and an A means an A. When I went to school, I worked really hard for my grades. But students nowadays are more, they feel entitled. Yeah, I think we're seeing that in all aspects of society. <laughs> right. So I was really glad to retire One of the things that I did is I got my idea for my invention while I was still working. And because I taught technical writing and I taught engineers how to write reports, one of their assignments was to write an instruction manual. So while I was doing it, I wrote an instruction manual for my invention. I was working right alongside of them, but I loved it. Then I gave them another assignment where they had to do a product description So I did that right alongside of them. And every assignment that I gave them, I used to do similar assignments before I became an inventor, but I used that time while they were working on it. I was working right alongside them. They didn't know, but I was doing that. In the end, they had to do a PowerPoint presentation. 
So I made a PowerPoint presentation for my product. So it was very helpful. Then I realized I needed to focus on my own self. So I, I retired. Okay. And are we talking about the tip and split? Yeah, that's okay. my first invention. Okay. I'm pretty good with actually figuring out the tip amounts, but actually being able to see the, the small print. And uh-huh. I saw where you've got not only a magnifying glass built in, but a light as well. Yeah, that's really why I invented it. I added the tips and the splits afterwards just to make it more fun. But this is actually my invention. So this is my tip and split, and it has the magnifier here. So you can read the small print on the menu and on the bill. Mm-hmm. And then it has a little light on the back more discreet than the light on your smartphone so you can actually read because I used to have a hard time when I would go to the restaurant and go look for a candle Mm -hmm. because I couldn't see in the dark restaurant so I said why doesn't somebody have something that can help us so I invented this and then I added the tip and split just to make it more fun because the magnifier and the light are the main parts of it this is handheld And then you can also figure out a tip and split the bill in three seconds. It's it's all in one. I had no idea how to do it. Zero idea how to do it. But I was lucky enough to have been married to an engineer who was brilliant. And he figured out all of the algorithms to make it simple to use. I'm not married to him now, but he still helped me. Mm -hmm. With Good man. Yeah, yeah. I give him all that credit. So I invented it. I had to learn all about not only inventing, but I learned about manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest problem because where do you go? (laughs) So I actually found a manufacturer at a trade show and they messed it up terribly and they couldn't do it. So then I found another one and I said, can you figure out how to do this? And he says, oh, this is engineering 101. They messed it up, too. It took me years before I could get a good manufacturer. And each Mm -hmm. time I was so disappointed. And finally, I got it right. Now, how did you find the the successful manufacturer? From a recommendation from another inventor. I'm in inventor groups. We share a lot. And it's actually wonderful to be a part of an inventor group because we're all sharing the same obstacles and figuring out how to come up with a solution. Instead of the 12 steps, you've got what, the seven? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was a little bit difficult for me because when I first invented my product, I went to a trade show (coughs) for inventors Mm -hmm. and my manufacturer had messed up and I didn't even have a product to show, but I had a table. So I just had pictures at the table. That's not really so good. And also they had a pitch contest. They had QVC Mm -hmm. at the trade show to pitch your product to be on QVC. I signed up to do it, but I didn't have a product. So I just talked about it and showed them pictures. And they actually loved the idea. But they said, please come back when you have a product. The next year I went back, I pitched to the same team. And I said, do you remember me? And they said, yes. Yes. And they said, well, I remember you too. And you said, come back when I have a product. So here's my product. And then I got on QVC. Okay. Now, talking about QVC, and this ties in with your manufacturing, how much product did you have to have in reserve for QVC? I think I needed 3,000 units. Wow. Mm -hmm. That can tie up a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. It's very expensive to be an inventor. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. I have 8,000 products now. I actually got on uh, the TV show, The View. So my product got on The View, and they told me I needed 10,000 units and 10,000 in reserve. Oh, wow. So I ordered 10,000 units, and I actually sold about 6,800 in one minute. Whoa. Yeah, it was really fantastic. But I ordered 10,000 more. A lot of people watch the shows and they don't have products for people my age. Right. I think that I'm one of the few inventors that invents products for people who get older. 
Most products are for young people, like apps or tech things. Mm. I'm sure a lot of people see a product and just like you said, boy, I can't see that small print. Yeah, There are a lot of us like that out there. If I go to a restaurant and I don't have my glasses and the light's dim, I'm functionally illiterate. Exactly. That's how I am. And that's what inventors do. They see a problem and they come up with a solution. And so I was so excited to come up with a solution because I'm the only product like it out there. Mm -hmm. So I had 10,000 units in my garage and then COVID hit. And I stopped promoting tip and split because this is for restaurants. Right. And first of all, most of the restaurants were closed. And second of all, I didn't want to encourage older people to go out to restaurants because I'm an older person. I just don't want to expose people to say, go try this in a restaurant. So I started something else. But now I'm coming back to tip and split again. When you were coming up with the idea for the tip and split, how did you validate it to make sure both that it was viable as well as to make sure it wasn't already out there and that there was an actual consumer demand for it? Well, how, first of all, when you have an invention, the one thing you have to do is make sure there is nothing that's like it. Right. Unless you make an improvement on something. But there was nothing like it. I did a lot of research on it, and I, I found zero like it. And so I thought, oh, you know, <laughs> that's great. And how did I find that it was something that somebody would want? Well, right. I went on QVC. People bought it. I went on The View, people bought it. I went on The Today Show, people bought it. Oh, I don't question that. I'm, I'm asking the, like, before you had... You have, to, you have to do a Google search and find out everything mm-hmm. on the market for it. I also had a patent attorney, and he also did a search okay. and couldn't find anything like it. Yeah, I'm just thinking that, obviously, I can see the value in it. You can see the value in it, and apparently... A lot of other people have seen the value in it, but you know, sometimes your friends and family will, eh, they'll lie to us. Exactly. That's a great so you idea. have to do a search. And, and luckily the patent office has a search options. So you can mm-hmm. search everything. You can also Google, Right. like I would do tip calculator, but nobody had a magnifier and a light with it, yeah, but they was... also do have lighted magnifiers. Mm -hmm. but they don't have the tip calculator on it. Yeah, that was a great marriage of the two. Yes, yes. Okay. So you have to do a lot of uh, searching because when you apply for a patent, that's also expensive. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that you're not infringing on someone else's patent. Okay. Now, how did you go about creating a prototype? Well, I I used my, my former husband for that and we came up with drawings mostly him he came up with drawings and then we sent them to the manufacturer to do it okay and they thought it was easy but they couldn't get it right (laughs) so many times i was disappointed Mm -hmm. it does sound like it would be easy to manufacture but then again I've never manufactured anything. Well, not only is it difficult to manufacture, but I wanted to manufacture it in the United States, but Mm -hmm. all the electronics are in China. They're all overseas. There are no manufacturers in the United States for electronic equipment that I could find. So you ultimately ended up having to go overseas for some or all of it. Then you get the language barrier and the differences And I used to actually have my ex-husband talk to them sometimes because they don't like to talk to a woman. Mm -hmm. I've heard that as well, actually. Yeah. uh But I did get it done, and I'm still so excited with it. I'm still going strong. During COVID, I put it on hold. I've put my product on hold many times because of manufacturing defects and then because of COVID. But now I'm about ready to go into it again. Okay. Now, did you ever try to license the idea for the tip and split? I met Stephen Key. Have you heard Mm -hmm. of him? Oh, yeah. Actually, he was gracious enough to be one of my first guests. He's wonderful. I actually have his book, One Simple Idea. Mm -hmm. I love his book. I love him. And I actually met him 
at an inventors group that I belong to in the Washington, D.C. area. He was a speaker there, and I so wanted to work with him, but I felt I was too far along to start licensing it. But actually, it's still in my mind to license the product. Yeah, I think his books are are great, and I think they provide all the steps. It's just for somebody that wants that extra reassurance, I think. If somebody would actually do it for me, Mm -hmm. I would do it, but they don't do it for you. They just tell you what to do. So I do have his book, but anyone who's just starting out should get his book and go through the steps and join it. If I had it to do over again, I would have joined his group. But I I met him, I think, right when I was about to be on QVC. I still feel like licensing is the best way to go. Okay. Now, has the tip and split been knocked off? No. That's surprising. I know. I'm very surprised. Because I don't do much advertising, so I don't think that people know Okay. Uh, about it. Maybe they'll see it on your show and start knocking it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that they do see it on the show. I just hope they don't start knocking it off. Right. People knock off other things. Yeah. Our audience is higher and more elevated than that. Thank you. For, for another thing that I did this year, I trademarked my name as Grandma Preneur. Okay, <clears throat> because mm-hmm. of my age, and I'm a grandma, and I'm a Grandma Preneur, and everybody loves that name. And now I see Grandma Preneur all over the place. I looked it up, and I see about fifteen people calling themselves Grandma Preneur, and uh, I talked to somebody about that because I have the trademark. Mm-hmm. And they said I can send like a cease and desist uh, letter to them to stop using it or get them to pay me. But I haven't done anything because I really can't see going after grandmas. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Although I paid for the trademark and I paid for the domain name. Yeah. Uh, I think what I would do if I were you is I'd let as many people that wanted to call themselves a grandmapreneur be a grandmapreneur. But the second they wanted to put it on a a coffee mug or a t-shirt, that's when I would enforce your trademark. How am I supposed to keep track of that? I don't know. Well, that's true. I think I would do a search on Amazon you know, first to see what just popped up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good advice. And if they're going to use it on products, then I think I have to go after them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because I'm an inventor, I know the value of trademarks. Yeah. I and think I you- trademarked Tip and Split. Mm-hmm. And then I trademark my new product called Write Your Selfie. It's also for older people. You realize that once you're gone, nobody's going to know about you or their ancestry. Mm-hmm. So I wrote during COVID, I decided to write my life story so that I could pass it down. So my grandchildren will know all about me and their children will know about me after I'm gone. And because I'm a former writing teacher, I made it into a course because I was a teacher. So the course is on how they can write their own book, their own life story. Now, backing up just a little bit, you've got another book, How I Got My Product on QVC, The Today Show, and The View, and More in Retirement, which chronicled your journey as well as had eight buzz tips dealing with marketing. Um, why I forget which one it was, but Be Charitable really struck me. <laughs> as one that not a lot of people would include. Could you talk about that a little bit? I think people like it when you're giving back something. That's not why I did it. When I first made my tip and split, I realized that everybody donates for cancer and now Parkinson's disease because they're always in the news. I found Macular Degeneration Foundation. They don't have as much money there to do research. So what I did is when I invented my product, I used to send them tip and splits. They did their first blog post about my product, tip and split. And what they did is anybody who would make a comment on their blog would receive a tip and split. So I was so happy to do that because this is not for people who have serious macular degeneration, but people who are at the beginning stages. Right. I don't have it, but I thought they might need a spokesperson or somebody 
to give light on it. So when I become famous, <laughs> I will talk about macular degeneration. Okay. Because I think that um, my product is for people with vision problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that people really identify with a product that helps others and that is giving back in some way. Right, right. And at this stage of my life, I'm not really doing it so much for money. I'm doing it to help people with both of my products. Mm -hmm. with the tip and split, I'm trying to help people. Because I know how I used to dread going into restaurants that were dark. I hated uh, it. I couldn't see anything. So I thought, instead of just struggling, why not make it fun? So my product is actually fun. Because when I whip it out, everybody looks at it. What's that? Oh, my yeah. goodness. So this is kind of making you the center of attention when you have your tip and split. Yeah, it's a cool little tool. Yeah, well, I like it. So I wrote a book with them. Um, the reason I wrote my book, <coughs> I'll tell you, is because when I first became an inventor, I realized that uh, you need to get out there and have some visibility and publicity. So mm -hmm. I hired a publicist to promote me. She got me nothing. Right. She charged me a lot and got me nothing. So then I hired somebody else that I had heard of. She got me nothing. And a lot of times when you're an inventor, you go for things because we want to be known and people take advantage of us because we all believe in our product. So I got my own publicity. I got my own self on QVC, the Today Show, The View and more. Yeah. I got my own. So I decided, why don't I write a book about what I did so that other people don't have to go spend that money for a publicist and can do it themselves? Well, thank you for doing that. A lot of inventors, too, I think they're focused on inventing and they understand how their product works and how to bring it about, but they don't understand how to sell it. Yeah, I didn't know any of that, but I still uh, am trying my best uh, to get known. And you're one of the people who's going to help me because being on a podcast is making me visible. Oh, yeah. So that's wonderful. You, you say you're not a podcaster, but on your Grandmapreneur site, you do have a, a session where you've talked with other coaches. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. kind of interview those. <laughs> I got this idea mm -hmm. because I'm an inventor. I have uh, two businesses, and I felt it was time to hire a business coach. Before I decided to hire one, I interviewed 17 business coaches to find out what they do, how they are different, and how they can help me. And I posted those on LinkedIn and on Facebook and on Instagram so that other people who are new entrepreneurs like me can decide if they need a business coach and what kind of business coach they need. I wrote an article for Entrepreneur Magazine that was published in June and it was called, Do I Need a Business Coach? One day I will do a podcast, one day, but uh, it's a lot of work, isn't it? It is. I got inspired by John Lee Dumas on Entrepreneurs on Fire. He releases one every day. And mm -hmm. then there's bonus episodes. And I thought, I could do that. And I'm struggling to get out one a week. Of course, it's I'm still working as well. But yeah, it's a lot of work. I know, because when I did that, I, I actually hired somebody to edit them for me because mm -hmm. that's a big job. So I actually paid for each of those episodes. It wrecks up, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I love doing it. It was my first time interviewing people, and I love doing it. And I thought about doing a, a podcast, but I have a few ideas. I'm not going to interview inventors. Because Robert Baer does it. Do you know Robert Baer? Yes, I've talked with him and Alan Beckley. They're both you know, really great guys and both yeah, they're, have really they're great wonderful. shows. Yeah. They're both wonderful. I was on both of their shows. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't interview inventors because they have it going. Yeah. I have a few other ideas for a podcast. The problem is the time. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you, my priority is my grandchildren. 
priorities right then. Exactly, exactly. They need me. I love them, and that's my priority now. So anything that I can do that doesn't cut them out okay. would be great. I, I apologize. I kind of pushed you away from talking about write your selfie. That's- I just wanted to you know follow up on a couple other things, but let's talk you know some more about that. <laughs> So this is my new project. I wrote my life story because I found out a lot of things about my past that nobody will will know after I'm gone. One of the incredible things I found out was that, and I didn't know this, my mother died about 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. and her parents immigrated to the United States from Poland in 1912. They had to postpone their trip because my grandma had morning sickness. And the trip that they postponed was on the Titanic. Wow. Can you believe that? I didn't know that. I found that from a cousin of mine because it was his father who our grandmother was pregnant with. My mother never told me. So if I didn't write that down in my book, nobody's going to know that once I'm gone. Because I'm the oldest one around. That's pretty amazing. I know. So I think that there are so many other things that I found out that I didn't know. For example, I have three grandchildren in California, and they're all in a prestigious tennis academy. The oldest one is nine. Mm -hmm. Okay, nine, eight, and six. And they all love tennis. And I actually have a Zoom call with my family members every week. And just Two weeks ago, I found out my mother went to a summer tennis camp, and she played against Bobby Riggs. Okay. You, have I've you heard, heard of him? Bobby. He's the one who lost to Billie Jean King. Okay. My mother played against him, and he wrote a, on the program to my favorite student, Rebecca. So I'm going to put that in. I'm going to revise my book and put that in because I nobody's going to know about Bobby Riggs right. for my grandchildren, but they can look him up. And, I very vaguely remember when he challenged her. Uh-huh. And I think I think she beat him pretty soundly, if I remember. I think so. And he was the first person called a male chauvinist pig <laughs> <laughs> because he thought, no sweat, he can beat her. And she won. Yeah. I have so many things about my history. My mother was also the first female law student at the University of Minnesota. And this is back in the late 1930s. And so I think that my grandchildren should know about their ancestry. Yeah, a lot of themes seem to pop back up. Like you mentioned your mother playing tennis, and now your grandchildren are playing tennis. Yes. And by the way, my father was an inventor. Okay. He just never knew knew anything about patents, but he was an inventor because I grew up when I was a little kid. I saw his inventions. What did he invent, if you don't mind my asking? Well, one of the things he invented was a curling iron. Okay. He was actually, in in World War II, he was a barber. And when he came back from the war, he took a metal comb and hooked it up to an outlet. And mm-hmm. so it heated. So when he was drawn, cutting someone's hair, he it would be hot, and he uh-huh. could curl it. Okay. And this is like, uh, I guess, about 70 years ago way before they had those products, but he didn't know what to do with it. But I think that somehow I became an inventor because I had the genes in me. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing my book, I wrote about my dad. Mm -hmm. It's not that they have to do anything fantastic. It's that most people, when their parents or their grandparents, when their grandparents die, they, they wish they had asked them questions. So I'm giving them the chance. So I made it in the form of a, a course okay. so that they can write their book. In six weeks, they can that, have a book of, of like their grandparents' life story. Is it interactive in that they, they are interviewing kind of their, grand, their grandparents? or No, what I do is my book is there are a few programs out there that teach you how to write your life story. Mm-hmm. Mine is very different because most people – when they want to write their life story, it's like a thousand pages and nobody wants to read that. Right. Okay. My book is based on pictures. I have them go through their photo albums because I'm sure their grandparents or even their parents 
have photo albums and they find the pictures that create some emotion in them mm-hmm. and they base they put captions around those pictures for example <clears throat> in my book and you, they end up after you know 6 weeks or maybe a little bit more this right. is my book okay. and it's based on pictures yeah i'm kind of i'm thinking back and just wondering how much how much family history has been lost not only in, just in my own right you know, well we i didn't encourage do that. people i encourage people to to search through it and to get it down before it's too late mm-hmm. you know so i think that what i'm doing i love this project i absolutely love it um, because i'm helping people yeah it's a lot of work for me but I, I absolutely love it because I think so many people want to tell their life story. Yeah, I can see where that, this would make a huge difference and kind of bring families together. Exactly, exactly. That's what I think it does. And um, a lot of what I'm trying to do is appeal to adult children, like in their 40s, to go talk to their parents or if they still have their grand grandparents talk to them because I can't imagine a better gift mm-hmm. to give to somebody that you, you love and they want to share their history. And that's right. Your selfie. So okay. I absolutely love what I'm doing. And so my target market is people my age, because I think that we should not be forgotten. So that's why I invented tip and split because There are so many gifts you can give to young people, but this is a great gift to give to an older person. Mm -hmm. And write your selfie is the best gift I think you could ever give to a person. Now, do you have any plans for any other products or inventions going? I have a few that I'm thinking of, but right now I'm kind of busy. (laughs) I can see that. Uh, I think if you're an inventor, you're always getting ideas. Mm Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm actually working with somebody who found me on LinkedIn, and she likes what I'm doing, and she wants to be an inventor. So we're working together on her project, on her invention. She's only 40 years old. And I'm so honored that she found me. She read some of my, my posts about being an inventor, and so now we talk once a week, and we're getting her to produce her invention. And I, I kind of want her to work with Stephen Key. Mm-hmm. And we'll see if that happens. Can you talk just a little bit about what inventing has meant for you personally and how it's changed your life? I love saying I'm an inventor. Okay. I, I was a teacher, you know, that's fine. But I love being an inventor because it's creative. Mm-hmm. And it's something that not many people say. Since you know Robert Baer, Did you know about his book? I have all these things that I was going to tell you about. I have his book. And you're in his uh, book, if I remember uh, correctly. What? You're in his book, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he quoted me. I love what I said. I was the shortest one. Oh, the shortest quote in his whole book. But this sums up about why I like inventing. Mm -hmm. It says, when we were children, we were curious about things around us. When does this change? Why does it have to change? I'm proud to be a trailblazer among women inventors and never lose my sense of curiosity. Does that answer your question? Why do I like it? Yeah, that does. Uh That's a great quote, by the way. He wrote in this book to me, Thanks, Connie, for contributing, trailblazer. Short, sweet, and to the point. I love it. Robert Mm -hmm. Baer. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's great. He's great. You know, and so I love what he does. He supports inventors all over. So you said, how has it changed my life? Look, at I get to meet incredible other inventors. I get to meet people like you who are doing incredible things. I, I get to meet people all over the place. So I just absolutely love uh, what I'm doing. I'm nothing special, but the fact that I'm doing it at my age, I think is good. Yeah, I'm not going to agree with you on that about your being nothing special, but I will agree that what you're doing is good, however. Thank you. I think people, I think that I want to be an inspiration to other older people, mm-hmm. knowing that just because of our chronological age, it doesn't mean that we have to stop 
And as I said in Robert Baer's book, why do we have to stop being curious? Children, they're always asking curious questions around about mm-hmm. everything. I ask those questions. You ask those questions. You read something and you ask questions about it. And I think that's a wonderful trait to have. Yeah, just to never stop being curious. So you and I are very similar, Mm -hmm. that we both like that sense of curiosity. So you asked me, how has it changed my life? Well, it's made me feel like uh, I can still be curious and help other people through my curiosity. Okay. Let's get ready to wrap this up. Good. What's what's the best way for somebody to contact you or to check you out? Anybody can check me out on grandmapreneur.com. It's like an umbrella. It has a tip and split and write your selfie so mm-hmm. they can see about both of my projects. Okay? And if okay. anybody wants to, you can find my email address on there, Connie at grandmapreneur.com. Anybody who wants my book, just email me and put buzz buzz tips, B U Z Z buzz tips, okay. and I will send you gladly send you the PDF of my book, and hope that it helps you. All right. What's the number one piece of advice that you can give for our listeners? <clears throat> the number one piece of advice. Okay, this is a quote that I read when I first got started, mm-hmm. and it's by Aaron Hansen, <clears throat> and it ah. says. What if I fall? Oh, but my darling, what if you fly? Is that not incredible? Yeah, that's the other way of looking at it. People overestimate what they can do in one year, but they underestimate what they can do in five. So I think that you should just try things out. Especially at my age, I have nothing to lose. Zero to lose. I'm having fun every bit of the way. So I would say if people have an idea, go figure out how to do it. If anyone wants to connect with me, I love giving advice to people. Send your idea to me. I will walk you through it. And I don't charge like other people do. (laughs) My advice is always free. Yeah. The inventors I've talked to, most of them are like you. They've been very warm and very open. They're willing to pay it forward. Right. I think that we are a breed of people who like to do things and we're all struggling and I've been through it so I can help people avoid some of the pitfalls. Okay. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you, Connie, for being a guest on Entrepreneurs Over 40. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much. If you'd like to leave feedback on this episode or suggest a guest, you can reach me at eo40show at gmail.com. That's EO40show at gmail.com. Next week on Entrepreneurs Over 40, we'll have on April Mitchell as she talks about how she has created multiple products and the processes that she uses to license them. I'd also like to take this opportunity to wish everyone out there a Merry Christmas. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss it or any other episodes. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneurs Over 40. Check us out at entrepreneursover40.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast directory.